All right. So anyone that's just joining us, who's just had a chance to check out the Narrative Shorts program, uh, thank you for joining us for this Q&A. And we're lucky enough to currently be joined by the teams behind three of the shorts that screened in the narrative program. Um, and so we're just gonna have a, a fun discussion. And if anyone has any questions that's watching at home um, in CineSend next to the screen that you're watching the Q&A on, there's uh, a little place where you can submit questions. So definitely let us know if you have any questions for any of the filmmakers. Um, so I guess just because it's the, the box that's next to me on, on my screen, but let's start with uh, the team behind Waffle, um, Carrie and Katie. Uh, folks watching at home will recognize that you both also starred in the film. Um, so I wonder if you could sort of talk about uh, your creative process, because you also wrote the film together and where the, this project came from. Yeah. Um, well, Katie and I used to be co-workers at um, College Humor and we became friends because we were seated next to each other <laughs> and we realized we liked the same weird things. Um, so we made a video together while we were still working there and then we, we knew we wanted to work together again on, on a bigger scale. Um, I'll let you take the baton from there, Katie. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so um, Carrie and I, basically we started meeting, we were like, we want to make a short film. So we started meeting at coffee shops regularly. And this kind of idea um, came from like, in other places, they like actually have rented friends and rent rented like family members. So just like taking that idea and um, putting it into kind of like a horror comedy. Yeah, it's a, I think in Japan, there's a real service yes there there is like people can rent um like cousins or dates like anyone you can rent anyone it's mm -hmm. very strange but it's like i mean great but with the as society becomes more like isolated and social media takes over stuff like that um we kind of just viewed that as becoming like more of a necessity where your human interactions are kind of like uh commodified and you pay for them yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, and that was something that rewatching the film earlier that really struck me because uh, I remembered it being a really fun sort of like zany film, but it was more disturbing watching it now. And I don't know if that's just like because the months that have elapsed since the first time I watched it have been really strange. And like, I don't know, the idea of like people being so stratified based on like, you know, their wealth and the amount of debt that they're in is like such a, a thing. Yes. That's worse every day. So, yeah, that's our intention to become more disturbing over time, as it truly. <laughs> it's definitely true. Um, so it looks like we're we're joined by Karishma Devdube, uh, who it looks like was able to find some good internet. So thank you, Karishma, <laughs> for for joining. Um, yes, thank you for having me. I'm sorry about this. I'm literally in the middle of traffic. <laughs> no, no worries. Well, glad you could make it work. I know that's the the biggest. Uh, sort of like terrifying factor looming over this whole thing is like if people's internet just decides not to to function. You know, I had two hours without it and I'm shocked at how much my life depends on it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially <laughs> these days. Um, well, I'll let you catch your breath um, and maybe we'll move on to Simone Baptiste, who's the director of $16,000. Um, also a graduate of Temple University, which we were just discussing before we went live. Um, which is very exciting, but um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit too, because you didn't you didn't write the film, you directed it, but um, the writers are also the the two stars of the film. Is that right? Yeah, um, Brody Reed and Ellington Wells really knocked it out of the park. We all came together and came up with the story and knew, like you know, to really accomplish what we wanted to accomplish, we needed to just dive into what each of us were really great at and so I came to the plate as director. Um, I've also been a comedy show producer in LA for like five years so it just kind of made sense at this point to bring everyone together for a film. So we literally stuffed as many people as possible into this short film um, but they're all like great stand-ups in LA um, but of course the subject matter it just struck us. Uh, reparations had been a major talking point during the 2020 primary race. Um, and of course, excluding the Black community in these conversations and 
also just ridiculous because how many years now you know 400 years and it's still something that people are trying to get elected off of so we just thought that was pretty absurd but of course um it's just been folklore in the black community just like you know wanting to see what reparations looks like so we decided to just you know make that come true um but of course the worst case scenario because um you know, I don't see it happening any other way unless we demand for more than just a check. Uh, but yeah, it was a lot of fun to put together uh, and, you know, it had a little bit of a message, which we always love. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, a really like good looking film too. It has such a fun, colorful um, sort of visual vibe going on. Could you talk a little bit sort of about how you visualized the film from the beginning? Yeah, um, you know, I love like bright colors and everything else but i also wanted to make sure that it was grounded so we had moments where um it was just so elevated like the music video scene or the commercial scene and then i wanted to bring everyone back down to earth but the colors are rich um janelle randall was our art director and you know we went like you know the colors of the african diaspora essentially and trying to bring those out through every frame of this film and so uh, yeah, I love it. I love how it turned out, uh, <laughs> but I mostly, you know, love the people that came together to make it with me. They were awesome, everyone. Awesome. Um, well, we'll move on to a very different looking film, but a equally beautiful film, uh, which is Dummy. Um, Lorianis, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about where the, the concept of this film, because it's so striking, where that came from. Uh, it it used to be a scene in a film feature film I was developing, and uh, this there is a system in Lithuania that you get the film funding for the pre-production. You get and to shoot a test scene, and I decided to use that money and make a short film instead. And so I, it it was in in the original sense in the original idea. It was just this. Uh, this criminal reenacting everything. But when I started developing a short film, I, I thought that it was a bit uh, uh, one-sided and it wouldn't make sense just uh, showing the horror. So as I was developing the, the detective character, the interrogator developed and then became the as as I kept writing, became bigger and bigger, and in the end, it became the main part of the film. So it kind of changed when when she 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 was added to the story. So yeah, so it it started with a reenactment, and then it went on as I was trying to figure out uh, what is this extreme form of si uh, violence and how does it uh, interact with this. Uh, also violence, but on a smaller scale, like uh, bullying and things like this. So it kind of developed from there. Yeah, and I mean, I feel like the the very ending of the film is really so integral to sort of bringing the entire thing together. Was that an element that came into the script later? Um, which, I mean, I think most people will have watched the film at this point, so we're not giving anything away, but I'm talking about the the dummy moving. Uh, yes, it it uh, it came to me while I was I was I started to think about the the doll as a character, and in the end I, I thought that the the only kind of character who understands the the point of view of uh, uh, of her is the doll, and uh, I in my head it's like a silent conversation between between them when the 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 man says come jump, jump right uh, jump with me and uh, it's an order the the doll just goes like did you really say that and she said yes she did <laughs> yeah he did and fuck and then she goes back to sleep because it's so absurd i think it's uh, it's so absurd that even the doll wakes up and realizes it yeah i mean it is it's absurd but it it gets its disturbing quality from the fact that like it's grounded in reality um 
and real dynamics that exist. Yeah, but it's also dynamics that you can find in film sets and work in different workplaces. It's not just a dynamic of like some kind of police or, or things like that. I yeah. think it's wider. Absolutely. I mean, did you look at sort of like police procedural dramas or sort of like the lineage of police films, even as something that you wanted to sort of like deviate from in making this film? No, I, I, I started by uh, trying to find some of uh, real policemen and talking with them and getting ideas. And this kind of thing uh, couldn't happen now, but in Lithuania, this kind of situation could happen like 20 years ago. This non this kind of procedural but casual kind of uh, reenactment. Now it's more professional, but uh, so it's not really. I I wasn't trying to get it uh, factually right. Yeah. I I wanted to get the 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 conflict and the the, the characters. The characters uh, actually are really uh, similar to real policemen. Yeah. but not the procedures. Right. Um, well, so moving on to Karishma, um, B2. Um, I know I, I've read somewhere that there is a, a real story of an actual event where these children were, were poisoned. Could you talk a little bit about how you came across that story and, and why and how you decided to, to turn that into this short film? Sure, yeah. Um, well, India has a really big comprehensive food program. It's sort of like a incentive for kids to come to school in most of the government schools. So, uh, you know, it happened since it's happened before this one incident, but the one I based the film on is particularly tragic because it was about two, 21 kids who died instantly after eating some, um, like a poison meal. Uh, but, you know, I, I think I started writing it from a place of anger when I first read about it and it didn't really work on paper that way. Um, I kind of struggled through that for about two years. Uh, I also didn't really want to make like an investigative film that tried to prove why or how this happened, uh, you know, but at the same time, I didn't want to like um, spare anyone in it. You know, I said it needed to be an account of what happened. So I figure that you would only really care about such an incident if you got to know the people who were involved in it. So I try to, you know, stem it fr from the experience of this eight-year-old girl who just is going through a normal day in school and the incident is sort of as invasive as it would happen with her. So we don't really track, um, you know, as the poisoning happens in real time, but we discover it with her. Uh, so ultimately it just kind of became more about you know, it, it, I went to boarding school for eight years. It was a very traditional, um, you know, uniform kind of society. So a lot of it stems from my experiences in school. And I had a bit of a weird relationship with authority as well. Um, so the film, you know, I had the luxury of writing it over three years. It kind of amalgamated into, you know, a lot more than just the poisoning. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, she's such an amazing central character to sort of view this from the perspective of. Um, how did you find, well, really the entire cast, but the, the lead actress especially, had she acted before? Uh, no, I mean, I think going in, I was pretty sure that I didn't, I couldn't use like professionally trained child actors for this, um, especially in India, they come with a very specific training. I kind of like wanted the kids to have a relationship with the space I'd be shooting them in and hopefully a relationship with each other because I didn't have the resources to kind of build on that before shoot. Um, so I just locked my location first and I started like introducing myself to local communities there. So the bulk of the film is street casted. Uh, there's only one professional actor in it. He came down from Bombay who played the male teacher, who was, who was great. You know, I realized I needed that in a cast of first-time performers. Uh, but the kid, I got very lucky with Rani, the girl who played Bittu. She, you know, was very, um, um, I mean, I think casting was pretty challenging, but it was also quite magical. I think I found her pretty early in the process and I was just, uh, you know, kept being drawn back to her. Eventually, I feel like I don't think I could have got through the film without her. It's very odd to write someone so specific and then actually find them halfway across the world. Um, so I 
in retrospect, it was uh, pretty bizarre, <laughs> to be honest. But most of the other characters were also casted locally. Like the guy who played the shopkeeper was like the local bartender, and you know the salon lady played the principal. I just kind of moved to the town and worked with them for two months for first shoot. That's amazing. And have they all had a chance to see the film, the finished product? Uh, some of them. I've tried to be very. They they're all gonna watch it on their phones, and I'm trying to avoid that. I haven't been able to go back home uh, in the last two years, so I wasn't able to really screen it for them. But I'm hoping to in January. So, but they've seen snippets. Yeah. Um, well, so we have a, a question from a viewer, and this is really for anyone that wants to answer, and I'm sure it'll be different for each film, but. Uh, the question is, what's the biggest difference when conceptualizing a short versus a feature? Is there room, more room for improvisation? And that's really for anyone. So <laughs> um, I don't know if anyone has actually conceptualized or you know written a feature uh, at this point, but um, I guess the first part of the question is, um, how is, is writing or conceptualizing a short film sort of its own? animal well i mean i can jump in and be like yes <laughs> i think um i think you know you kind of get tired of trying to be clever or base a film on a trick as well which is i think a lot of what a short is about um but with the feature you have so much time to spare you I, like i'm writing one now and i'm i'm, I'm really have to like keep questioning myself how, like how i want to spend that time i think it's more fun with character i'm pretty sure like everyone agrees on that there's a lot more room and time you can use to develop it but I think shorts are just, I, I, I realize I after five years of writing and directing shorts that no one really watches them except short filmmakers and programmers <laughs> um, but you know I think it's definitely its own thing because writing a feature feels very uh, unfamiliar right now <laughs> yeah I'll just jump in and say um we, Carrie and I had a, a very difficult time um, limiting the page count for the short. Um, Cause yeah, there was so much more we wanted to explore and talk about. Um, and you know, it's a short, so you have to make it short. <laughs> and um, that was difficult. And then we actually did end up writing the feature version of um, Waffle. And it was kind of the opposite issue. We were like, oh, well, suddenly we have so many more pages to fill up. Um, and you can, yeah, exactly. You can like really get into the characters and that's something that you completely skip when you're doing the short. And also I feel like in terms of actual improvisation, I guess the hope is that you have like a bigger budget on a feature where you have time to improvise in terms of actually being on set and maybe improvising in addition to the writing, um, but like in the acting portion, because yeah, in the short, it's like the most expensive part for us was the location. <laughs> and oh. we were like, we don't have time to improvise. Like we gotta, no. this is the can. We said um, exactly every word and then right. move on. Right. Exactly. That's so funny. Cause yeah, you probably get that question a lot with a comedy short cause people just assume that like actors and comedies are like coming from a place of like doing a lot of improv and whatnot, but you're so right. Like it's a, a costly endeavor. So you can't just yes. like right. wing it when you get to set. Yeah. That's so funny. Oh, Simone, are you talking? Yeah, oh. can you hear me? Now I can. Okay, cool. I was like, for me, I had like no concept of like, you know, time equals money. So we definitely improv like so many scenes um, for this short, but I just feel like with comedy, you know, I, I think about like uh, Adam McKay and, you know, Step Brothers was like a four hour or five hour movie before they had to like cut it down because of all the like improvising and so like for this short I knew to get like that sibling dynamic like we had to do a lot of improv um you know just to punch up the jokes but I think that obviously like when you have like such great talent on your hands like they can just come up with stuff on the fly and you know having mostly a stand-up comedian cast was like really helpful for that so yeah we did a lot of you know adding to the script uh probably uh in every scene probably, but it was a lot of fun. You know, if I'm not laughing on set, then I like, we have to keep going until I, at least I laugh, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, if nobody else in the audience has more questions, I do just want to touch base. Obviously, um, everyone's probably sick of talking about COVID, but I am particularly interested just as 
filmmakers, um, sort of what it's been like over these last few months, were there projects that haven't been able to get off the ground? How has your practice sort of changed? And more importantly, what do we have to look forward to from you in the future? Um, so we can start with the, let's start with the waffle team again, just because again, you're next to me on the screen. Oh. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I, I guess like one, one thing I was just grateful for was that our film was already finished. <laughs> when this when COVID happened, yeah. because I feel bad for a number of friends I have who are in the middle of making their passion project and now it's just kind of on hold. Um, but yeah, I think it was an interesting kind of pivot for both of us. Um, like our, our premiere was supposed to be at South By and that was like one of the first festivals uh, to go down with, with COVID cancellations. Um, but seeing how every, how, you know, so many have pivoted to being digital, it's, um, it's been an interesting experience and I, I feel like it's been nice to get to connect with people and do things like this over Zoom and have people um, view the film digitally, which I don't think either of us anticipated that it would play out that way. Um, yeah, and then in terms of other, other projects, like right now, we've been really working hard on the feature that like Katie mentioned. Um, yeah, other thoughts on that, Katie? Um... Yeah, I think that's, I feel like we would have maybe shot something else this year, mm -hmm. um, just like another short or something like just to get more practice and make another thing, which is always like kind of my, my preferred method of doing anything. But um, yeah, so this is, it, it has been like the weirdest year, <laughs> truly. Um, so hopefully next year, we'll be able to like actually shoot more things and do stuff, but. Yeah, well, looking forward to the feature for sure. I'm really <laughs> intrigued to know where these two characters go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Simone, maybe? Yeah, um, I'm kind of in the same boat where uh, I got to attend one festival in person before everything shut down. We won that festival, which was cool, but after that, it was just all online. Um, so yeah, similar sentiments. It's still good to be able to, to attend everything because we're all at home. Um, but I think um, for sure, I'm you know stressing about like when can I shoot the next thing. Um, you know, I already have lots of ideas, but for now, um, Brody Ellington and I are just developing 16K as a series. So we'll be pitching it out and all that. So crossing my fingers, but. Yeah, um, a lot of people have resonated with it. And so, um, you know, we just have to keep on pushing off of that momentum. Yeah, well, I can definitely see how that would make an amazing series. So that's really fun to find out. Um, uh, Laurinus, if do you have any projects in the works or, or how what have you been working on over these last strange several months? We had a, <clears throat> we had a pause in quarantine in Lipina in the summer. So we managed to shoot the film I was prepping. We had like an, the whole August to, to shoot and now we're back quarantine and I'm editing. So I kind of managed to get into this small gap. So I, I'm kind of happy with that because now I have friends who are starting to shoot now and I, I feel that they will not going to make it because we had an election and the just until the election everybody said that there will not going to be a quarantine but the day after the election we said that it's going to be a quarantine so. yeah well yeah you never know <laughs> um and you'd mentioned that you were had originally thought of dummy as a, a feature is there any plan to to maybe turn that into a longer it's project hmm? it was just a small part which i took it out made a, a separate thing a short and now the feature is kind of, uh, it's connected, but it's like the dummy is a prequel because the feature is, uh, is the same story has happened and just after four years, relatives of the victim come back to the town and visit all the places connected with the, with the crime. It's, it's like uh, they go just sightseeing, they go to the place where he, the, the boy was kidnapped where he, he was uh, held captive, tortured, and then murdered. It's like a, 
It's called, yeah, it's like they go on sightseeing trip. Wow. Um, and Karishma, uh, what have you been working on? Um, I'm trying to write my feature for the first time. So it's been a lot of just staring at a wall for a couple of hours uh, at a goal. <laughs> um, I've, you know, it's been a weird year, but I actually ended up um, being very productive in terms of writing. It's been hard to like finish projects, which happened in uh, pre-COVID worlds or, um, you know, it's been hard to get for a book, but writing has been nice. Uh, so I'm just trying to figure this, you know, longer form out. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm working on something that's based on my family back home in India. It's a big family of dysfunctional women, uh, so it's kind of based around a weekend of that in like this small town in northeast India. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah. Um, well, I'm really glad, even in the strange year, that we were able to share all of your films with Philly audiences, um, and I'm very grateful to all of you for for taking the time to talk today. So. Thank you all so much. Um, Thank you. And, Thank yeah, you. And, and hopefully everyone at home uh, has already had a chance to see the films, but if you haven't, definitely check them out. Um, and thank you everyone at home for watching. So thank you everyone and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Well, hello everybody. My name is Travis True. I'm programming manager for the Philadelphia Film Festival. Um, and we're lucky enough to be joined by the writer director of the film White High, Tomer Shushan. Um, who's taking some time to talk to us a little bit about the film. Uh, so Tomer, thank you again for, for joining us today. Thank you. Um, it's such a powerful film, tells such a powerful story. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the genesis was of, of the film, where you got this idea. Um, it's interesting. Um... Uh, well, in Israel, we get uh, money to make films uh, from film foundation, uh, governmental, uh, and we like sending scripts. And um, uh, if you're lucky, you get uh, money to make your film. And I was working on my first film after film school. Um, and, and on the deadline that I was supposed to send the script to the film foundation, um, I went to meet my uh, mentor and uh, to finalize the script and send it over. And uh, while I was on the way, this story actually happened to me. So I was, it was so hard and I was so overwhelmed and it was a um, horrible experience, uh, experience. But um, luckily in real life, the story ended a bit um, better. And uh, when I met my mentor after this experience and, and this story, she told me to forget about the script that we're working on and maybe we should, I should try to just write it down. So it took me 40 minutes to write it. Um, it was like when you wake up from a dream and you need to like uh, write it um, on, the, on the same moment because otherwise you won't remember. So how it went and... Um, until I shot the film, um, the script was like barely changed, you know? Wow. So it was a, a pretty immediate process for you. That's great. Yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the idea to have it be all one shot? Because that feels like such a central part of, of the film. Yeah. Um, when I finished with the script and got the money and now I need to direct it and um, I always wanted to uh, be as a director to to take the script to do to give it some another interpretation. Um, so I thought, what was the thing that was uh, there with me with the care that's supposed to. Um, Show him. So I thought about to make it in one shot because to hear me. You're breaking up a little bit. Um, can you hear me fine? Oh. Yeah. So okay. I, I really wanted to, to, to do it one shot because I wanted um, the audience uh, won't feel any uh, any cut any. Uh, something that can harm the story because this story happens so fast 
that I couldn't rise and to be myself for a second and to breathe and uh, to know what I'm re what my next action. Uh, so I decided to do it like in one shot, like one breathe, uh, no cuts, so the audience can feel the character, feel the rhythm that can't be cut. And uh, that was the main reason. Well, that's a pretty brave choice. <laughs> um, yeah. and I imagine it, it caused some complications that you wouldn't have had to encounter had you not chosen to make the film that way, but it, it definitely makes the film that much more immediate and powerful. Um, yeah, it was, it was super challenging to, to do it that way, but uh, um, I knew that's the only way to give this story um, another layer. Uh, so that what the character um, feel like and, and what is action made out of, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. No, it definitely makes you feel like you are with the character sort of going through that experience with them. And I wonder if you could talk about sort of what you, how you hope that the audience will respond to the film, not just when it's over, but even like throughout the film. Uh, basically, uh, in real life, this story um, made me, uh, change me as a person, not just like uh, as a filmmaker or like, um, as someone that want to um, tell a story. I, I, I thought it's really changed me as a person because it made me realize that uh, this is not how you act and behave to people, no matter who they are and where they come from and how they look like, or, you know, uh, um, I was always sure that I'm not like that, but my instinct made me be um, someone that is not familiar to me. And I thought that maybe if people uh, will have the chance to see it, uh, they, will, they will feel where it comes from and they will feel that maybe it's gonna change something in them on the next time that they gonna meet someone um, and they gonna confront someone um, and they will understand that there are much more important things than like stuff that we uh, have. Um, and it's like per people. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's almost disturbing to look back and know that at the beginning of the film, I think I empathized with the main character's um, concern about his property <laughs> so much. And then yeah. over the course of the film, you sort of go through that journey with him of like seeing how unimportant that actually is. Um, but shifting gears to talk about the sort of technical aspect, could you talk about the process of planning how you were going to like how much rehearsal sort of had to be done before you could actually shoot? And then how long did you actually have to spend shooting it? How many takes were there? Yeah, so at first, uh, me and my, uh, me and the DOP had lots of uh, planning on how this all choreography gonna look like, how people gonna be far from the camera, when the camera getting close, all this, um, uh, choreography that we built with the camera. Then after it, I started to build another choreography with the with the with an act with the actors and then with the crew members because they all also just um, they, they were also there, and you know every shadow, every small thing or noise can can ruin the shot. So we needed to build choreography to every stuff like every person from the crew. And um, it was very, very hard until we found the, the, the right formula that um, everyone can like work together. Um, and it took uh, a bit time. That was the main work in this film. Um, and and um, yeah. So how many takes did you actually have to do before you were able to achieve that, that perfect? Yeah. So I had money to make it in one night. So I, I, I did it like uh, uh, in one night and it took, we, we have like, uh, we had like um, six, six full takes, I think. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> yeah, also the, the, the first take that was uh, fully complete was just happened in like a um, few minutes after midnight. And we had only three hours or four hours left to make it. But then after the first time, the first one happened, it gave lots of confidence to all the crew. 
uh, and also to me that I needed to be the leader and um, then it like went very very well and uh, I think the take that uh, we chosen is like the one before the last. Wow that's yeah. amazing. Were there any shots or sequences that were particularly challenging for you to sort of get right within that? Like um, the, the main the main image in this film that was the most clear but I, I was very flexible that things gonna be not by how I planned because I knew it's one shot you can't really control it like not with the money that I had not in one night you can control every second but there were like like one image in the film which is the people that hiding in the fridge um, that I really really knew how it's supposed to look and how it's supposed to feel to everyone and how it's supposed to make the audience feel. And we had it, uh, the, the best one was in the take that uh, I chose. And um, I can tell you that uh, there were other takes that they were like better in other parts. But for me, that was the most important part. Interesting. So yeah, so like one scene could dictate, you know, which, which take yeah. you actually go. <laughs> That's that's fascinating. Um, well, I wonder if you could talk about the title, which is White Eye. Uh, well, there is few meanings for it, um, but the main one is because I thought that this person, uh, I mean, white eyes for me, it's like an image for blindness. And I thought he was blind uh, in the film. And also um, he is, uh, coming to the story and talking to the other guy from a white person eyes um, point of view and uh, what's really nice about it that the uh, Eritrean actor he have white eye because he's blind in one one eye so I felt maybe it's like um, that's the, that's the thing that's supposed to be in the title yeah no it's a a definitely very evocative title. Um, well, so obviously, you know, the world's changed so much in the last several months, I'm sure uh, for a filmmaker, it's been challenging for you, but um, what do you have in store? What are you, are you working on any projects right now? So yeah, now I'm, uh, um, I'm, I'm developing White Eye to a feature film. Um, Right now, it's supposed to start almost the same, and then the two characters gonna meet again in the future, and they're gonna do something pretty big together, um, full of compassion this time, and um, some friendship gonna build between them. Wow. So is it gonna be uh, another one, one take feature or not this time? Uh, I don't think I'm going to go to one take feature because I have this experience and I want to be more free to direct um, scenes that I imagine um, with more control. Uh, I think that in White Eye it was a very, very um, good choice, but um, I'm not sure that it's going to be the same one for the feature film. I need to think about it, but probably not. Um, but yeah, I can tell you that I really admire and I really inspired by films that uh, the camera is going and there is long takes and it makes the connection between the audience and the, and the world in the film um, get much, much close and feel it more. So I, I can tell you that, I'm, that there is lots of influence by, by this kind of cinema. But uh, let's see, I'm, I'm not sure yet. Yeah, well, maybe for your own mental health, it would be good not to, <laughs> to take on that challenge. Um, yeah, well, obviously super excited about seeing that film one day when it comes to fruition. So that's really exciting to hear. Um, well, Tomer, thank you so much for, for taking a little bit of time to talk about the film. And thank you again for, for making the film and for allowing us to share it with Philadelphia audiences. Really appreciate it. Sure, it's my pleasure, and I wish I could be there and experience the festival, but uh, yeah, I'm super lucky that um, fest, like, that you did it online, and I have the chance also to uh, screen my film, uh, so thank you very much, and I'm looking forward um, to experience the festival.
Thank you and have a good night. You too.